Hello and welcome to the programme where you can help solve crime. We'll show you reconstructions filmed where the crimes actually happened using real witnesses wherever possible. And in case there's anything that you recognise, the detectives behind me, along with BBC researchers, are waiting for your call, as are police throughout the country. Thanks to Crime Watch viewers, a number of people have been in court since our last programme, charged with serious crimes. Last Tuesday, a man was jailed for life for a murder we featured back in March. The victim, Elizabeth Sutherland, or Totsy as she was affectionately known, was found stabbed to death in her home in the village of Kalboki. It seemed a random, pointless crime, but detectives established that the motive had been robbery. At Inverness High Court last week, in sentencing her killer, the judge recommended he serve a minimum of 25 years in jail. Over a year ago, in our Aladdin's cave, we showed you these paintings. Police suspected they'd been stolen, especially the Renoir there and the Cezanne, now, thanks to your calls, they've been returned to their rightful owners. And following the programme, 17 burglaries were cleared up right across the country. Two weeks ago at Reading Crown Court, two men were jailed for receiving stolen goods. One was sentenced to 18 months, the other to four years. We'll have another Aladdin's Cave tonight, though uh, it won't be classical art. Maybe there's something here that's yours. It's not often we have a happy story to report on Crime Watch, but we do have one tonight. Two months ago, we showed you this picture of a Land Rover, which was a gift from St Andrew's Church, Bedford, to needy villagers in Madagascar. But before it could be sent there, it was stolen. Well, police haven't got it back, but Madagascar will have its Land Rover. Staff of EPL International in Hertfordshire, part of the John Lang Group, were so upset when they saw our report that they began to work converting one of the company's own Land Rovers. It took them four weeks of working lunch breaks and weekends to get the Land Rover ready. And now I'm happy to say, thanks to them, it's on its way to Madagascar. And I've just been told that a 23-year-old man has been charged tonight with two rapes in the Aldershot and Fleet area that we covered in last month's programme. Our first case tonight is a robbery that happened back in May. But conceivably, you may right now see the proceeds on the open market. It was a daylight raid on a house in a country village and the gang took away a collection of silver that had been a lifetime's work for its owner. The story starts earlier this year in London. Christie's in South Kensington. Bertram Vince is a regular visitor to the London auction rooms. He's been collecting antique silver for a dozen years, and though he's modest about it, he's something of an expert. I'm off a 15 only here to start me. 80. Putting 20. At 20 only. 22. Bertram's family owns and develops property in East Anglia. 150, 160, 170. But silver is his first love, and he's a well known figure in the antique sales rooms. Your number, sir? 241, thank you. Bertram lives with his parents in the quiet village of Wyrham near Kings Lynn in Norfolk. His family have lived here for three generations. It's lunchtime on Tuesday, May the 28th, and there were few people about who witnessed the events that shook the village that early afternoon. It's five to one, and opposite the Vince's house in the sub post office, Ken English is locking up. It's half day closing for Wyrham's only shop. As usual, the village seems quite empty. At about 10 past one, a neighbour noticed a car he'd never seen before parked right outside the Vince's house. He remembers a green Y-registered Cavalier saloon. It's now early afternoon and Bertram's parents have gone out. None of Bertram's friends or neighbours remembers ringing him that afternoon. Bertram spent about half an hour working in his study. The VAT inspectors had visited the week before and he was making sure the records of his silver deals were up to date. Who is it? Open up. 
We're from Customs and Excise. But you were here last week. Uh, I'm afraid you'll have to make an appointment. You can't come in now. We have a statutory right of entry. No, you haven't. You come back when you've made an appointment. Oh, come on, ah. Leading the investigation is Detective Inspector Kevin Coyle. Robert, they're very lucky they haven't got a murder charge over them. Yes, that is correct. Um, due to the way he was trussed up, gagged and had the bag over his head, he had great difficulty in breathing. He nearly suffocated. Yes, he did. The Green Cavalier that we saw at one point in the film, you're fairly convinced that that was in fact the robber's car, yes? Yes. Later that afternoon at 3.45, a similar car was seen to go from the direction of the house and turn onto the A134 forcing an oncoming vehicle to brake to avoid it. Right. Now, what about the men? What sort of description do you have of them? Yes. The man at the door was about 40 years of age, six foot tall, proportionate build. He had dark hair and had a well-trimmed moustache. He was wearing a dark pinstripe suit, was very smart and had an air of confidence about him. And what about the heavy that came bursting in through the kitchen door? Yes. That man was younger, about 30 years of age, slightly heavier, five foot ten tall, had dark black curly hair and a Greek Mediterranean look about him. Right, now about a hundred thousand pounds worth of silver was stolen. You've brought some items here that, well, they're not replicas, but they are similar, I gather. Yes, amongst the property stolen was about 70 snuff boxes, of which this is a similar one. Um, the design on this was similar to some of those what were stolen, although there were other ones which were larger and smaller. Right, what's that little thing you've got there? That is a vinaigrette. There was about 40 or 50 of those stolen. These were used by ladies to put perfume in and to sniff. Right. And this tea set or coffee set? Yes. The tea coffee set was made by Angel Brothers in 1861 and has a chaste design and the floral chaste design. Which dealers would recognise? Yes, they would, by the makers and the design. Tell me about the deed box that you've also brought in that's in front of the desk here. Yes. That deed box, or a similar deed box to that, was taken and has not been recovered. We think they took this by mistake, thinking it contained a lot of silver, but all it actually contained was Mr Vince's books, which had his name and initials on them. Right. There's a reward, isn't there? Quite a big one. Yes, there is a reward of £20,000 for the recovery of the property or for the arrest of the people. Right, Mr Coyle, thank you. The number to call, if you can help, 01-811-8055, 811-8055. You can speak in confidence to a detective, or, as always, you can ask, if you wish, to speak to a BBC researcher. Or you can call Norfolk Police direct on Kings Lynn 766-233. That's 0553 for Kings Lynn 766-233.
Well, now the Crime Watch incident desk. Here are Police Constable Helen Phelps and Superintendent David Hatcher. First on incident desk, a mystery. On Wednesday the 6th of November, Philip Nixon, a 32-year-old civil servant, was murdered in a busy North London street in the middle of the rush hour. Yet no one knows why or how he was killed. Following a fireworks party the night before, Philip took the day off work. Just after five o'clock, he left his flat in Petherton Road in Stoke Newington to do some shopping. As usual, he walked down Fern Tower Road to his local grocer. Then instead of going straight home, he must have turned into Newington Green Road, heading south towards the Balls Pond Road. Just 200 yards further on, as he walked across the railway bridge, something happened. Within seconds, Philip Nixon was killed by a violent blow to his head. It must have happened in front of hundreds of commuters heading for North London and beyond. Witnesses may not have realised they'd seen a murder, or they may have thought he was lying there drunk. But if you were passing by and can shed any light on what happened, please ring us here. Still in London, a violent rape in broad daylight just over three weeks ago, and the attacker was particularly distinctive. It happened at the back of the Copthall Sports Centre swimming pool in Mill Hill on Wednesday the 20th of November. A witness remembers a young man with a dog hanging round the footpath that leads to Pursley Road. It was here that he stopped his victim and at knife point dragged her into the bushes and raped her. You may recognise him. He's only five foot three tall, about 25 years old, with light ginger hair and pockmarked skin, but our best clue may be the dog. It's the size of a small Labrador with a rough black and brown coat and answers to the name of Bruce. Police fear the man could attack again. So if you've any idea who he is, ring us in complete confidence. Next we move north to Derbyshire where Christmas came early for a tall, lanky robber. He walked into the Leeds Permanent Building Society in the centre of Chesterfield on Tuesday the 26th of November. The security camera snapped him as he snapped up about two and a half thousand pounds. And obviously feeling festive, he wished the cashier a Merry Christmas before he fled. With the police close behind, the robber shed his disguise as he escaped through the alleyway towards the town centre car park. This coat was among the clothes he dropped there. It's covered in these blue paint stains. Perhaps you recognise it. And remember the man we're after. He's about six foot tall and very slim. If you recognise him or that coat, call us. Nearly two weeks ago, a farmer in Essex made a horrible discovery. The body of a boy, later identified as 14-year-old Jason Swift. Jason's whereabouts over the past few months are largely a mystery, but Essex police have now uncovered new evidence about his movements. He was reported missing from Hackney by his sister on the 6th of July. Since then, there have been several possible sightings in London, and one definite one in the Stamford Hill area on November the 5th. A few weeks later, in Chipping Onga, Jason's body was found in a copse. The copse isn't far from the M11 and M25, and it's now thought he'd been murdered elsewhere and then dumped there. Jason was about five foot six inches tall, with brown hair and blue eyes, and his two front teeth were missing. If you saw him anywhere between July and November, please give us a ring. And finally, police in Suffolk are looking for 15,000 bottles of German wine. They were on this Scania tractor unit when it was stolen from Mendlesham in Suffolk on Sunday the 24th of November. The trailer was found the following day in south-east London. Needless to say, the wine, £40,000 worth, was gone. Amongst the hall were 500 cases marked Stefan Oriel wines, like this, and also hundreds of bottles of rare German wines, like these, which are not on sale in shops in this country. Quite coincidentally, 70 cases of this one were destined for the Nick Wine Bar, a police restaurant in south-west London. And apart from their obvious interest in its return, there's a 10% reward. That's £4,000. Or put another way, 1,500 bottles, enough to make any Christmas a merry one. So, if you've seen any of those on sale, or can help with any of our other incident desk cases, ring us now. And the number to ring, as always, is 01811 8055. That's 01811... 8055. In our October programme, we asked you to identify this small ticket. West Yorkshire Police believe it could lead them to the killer of 66-year-old Sandy McClelland. He was stabbed to death, and this ticket was found near his body on October the 7th this year. We received a lot of calls about it, and we can now reveal far more about this strange case. 
Tonight, for the first time, a number of unusual forensic clues will be made public by the man who's leading the inquiry, Detective Superintendent Ken Baines. First of all, though, let's see our reconstruction. There was snow on the ground when we actually made the film, but remember we were having fine and sunny weather in September when Sandy McClellan disappeared from his home in Leeds. Sandy lived on this estate in Winmore, on the outskirts of the city. Every Friday, he'd walk down to the local pub, the Penders Arms, where he was known by a lot of the regulars. Sandy's stepson, Brian Horn, and wife Elizabeth, lived just round the corner from his flat. They spent a lot of time together, and Sandy looked forward to the Friday pint and game of dominoes. Since he rarely socialised with anyone else, the Horns were a little surprised when he told them that someone was coming to stay overnight at the flat. We now know that Sandy McClellan had a visitor on the evening of 5th of September. That's exactly a week before he went missing. We're led to believe that this man is called Stuart. Brian and Elizabeth Horn, the stepson and stepdaughter, tell us that they visited the flat about quarter to 11 on that Thursday evening and actually saw Sandy with... This man is about 30 years of age, 5 foot 6 to 5 foot 8, with sandy coloured hair or light brown hair. He told the Horns that he was separated, that he got two children. Very, very vital that we find him as soon as possible. Uh, oh, this is Stuart. He's, uh, he's come down to Leeds about a, a driving job. Well, you know, like a cup of coffee. Uh, you're lucky, the kettle's on. <laughs> You think you can get your job done? Oh, should do. You know, I've got exams, CSEs, O levels, oh, and references. I should be okay. Uh, we've been down the red line. What a bind. <laughs> well, you should have come for me, went, will you? Uh, well, I didn't know what you were about, did I? Yeah, yeah. Has your coffee? Yep. Yeah, this one. You like a sandwich? No, not me. It would seem that the purpose of the visit with this man, Stewart, was to try to get a driving job in the Leeds area, possibly with connected with the mining industry. So therefore I want every possible firm or every firm in the area visiting with a view to seeing if they had anybody or set anybody on or interviewed somebody around about the 5th or 6th of September for such a job. Now we've got to concentrate on the evening of Thursday the 12th of September. That's the, the last night time he was last seen alive. We know now that he went to the Asda supermarket at Crossgate with Brian and Elizabeth home in Sandy's own car, that's the Ford Cortina, the light green one. They were accompanied by the 16-year-old granddaughter, Lynn, who they dropped off en route. They went into the supermarket. The indications are, as far as the homes are concerned, that Sandy was in a very, very good mood. There was quite a lot of by-play between them whilst they were going around the supermarket. Uh, hello. <laughs> Have you got everything now? Yeah. I see so. I see you later. Hi. Yeah. Yeah. We'll raise again. Don't we win. <laughs> they came back from the supermarket to the Holmes house in White Lath Approach. It would seem that the car was driven by Brian both to the supermarket and back to their house. Hey, come on in. Oh, I've gotten a bit of heart run. I think I, I think I'll go him. Have a bath. Take an early night. Aye. Aye. Okay. Give us the keys, lad. Yeah, we'll see you later, innit? Aye. Aye. Bye. 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 Good night. Good night. Good night. Good night. Good night. And then Sandy drove the car, it would seem, back to his own flat in Willowgarth Avenue. About ten minutes later, there was a knock on the door at the horns, and Sandy had come back. Ryan! Ah, you left your cigarettes? Oh, <laughs> no doubt you'll need them before the morning. Thanks. See you, Valley. Good night, lad. Good night. Good night. He left the house straight away, but we do not know whether he drove off or whether he'd come back to the house in his car or whether he walked back to his flat. That is the last positive sighting that we have got of Sandy McClelland 
still alive at 8.20 p.m. when he left there. The next positive sighting that we've got of Sandy McClellan's motor car is at 11.30 a.m. on Monday the 7th of October when it was found on the car park in the centre of the big house known as the Bethel Street car park. This car park is adjacent to the Calder and Hebel Canal. It's also adjacent to the Wheelers Working Men's Club, quite a busy club that seems to have a considerable number of members there. <laughs> Wheelers was busy the night Sandy disappeared. There were several charity acts on and the place was full. Perhaps you were there. Remember it was Thursday, September the 12th. Could you have seen Sandy's car in the car park, either that night or any time afterwards? We need to be getting in amongst the shoppers to see if we can establish, first of all, when the car was left there, and if possible, of course, establishing who exactly or actually left the car on the car park. Yeah. Okay. So police need to speak to anyone who knew or saw Sandy or his green Ford Cortina in the Leeds Brighouse area around September the 12th. They'd also like anyone who's known Sandy to contact them tonight. He has moved around a lot in his life. He lived in Edinburgh for many years, so perhaps you knew him then. In 1968, he moved to Corby for a job as a storeman with the local council. Then he lived in Grantham for three years. He moved back finally to Edinburgh to Grangemouth in 1983, but he moved south to Leeds in April this year. Well, Detective Superintendent Baines, we do know about Stuart from the film. Now, we have a video fit of him. Could we have another description? Yes, he's about 30 years of age, 5 foot 6 to 5 foot 8, with either sandy or light coloured hair, smooth skin, very smartly dressed. Absolutely essential that we trace this man. He may not be connected in any shape or form with the, with the killing, but we need desperately to find him. We do need to eliminate him. And we need to eliminate him as well. Right. Now, the clues themselves. The first clue is the bedspread, which was found in the boot of the car with Sandy's body. What does that tell you? Yes, as a result of uh, some forensic examination by using camera filters, we have, in fact, been able to, or they've been able to bring up uh, a trademark on there, which indicates, as you can see on the screen, that it was only an actual fact manufactured in 1961 for the British Army by a firm just on the Lancashire-Yorkshire border. The other important thing is that this little ticket that we talked about before was stapled to the bedspread. Yes, and the indication so far is that that is probably either a dry cleaning or a laundry ticket. And again, we would ask anybody who's worked in such business for the last 24 or 25 years, if they can identify the format of that ticket, would they get in touch with us as soon as possible? Absolutely, again, essential. Right, now the clothes that Sandy was found in weren't his own. They were too big for him, weren't they? Yes, that's correct. The, the jeans, similar to the ones on the model, uh, were four inches too long for him in the leg. The jumper is about a medium size, but of course the most significant thing is the... The head warmer, it appears like a balaclava, but it is in actual fact an army issue head warmer or cap comforter used by the military for some considerable time. And again, as with using camera filters, we've been able to bring up once more the date of the manufacture of that, 1952, by a firm called WH White and Sons Limited in Leek in Staffordshire. And we know that that firm manufactured over 300,000 of those head warmers between 1952 and 1956. And you deduce something else very important from one mark on it, Yes, didn't you? we saw there's some, some indication of what, what appeared to be red ink. Uh, again, this wasn't visible to the naked eye, so we sent that to the laboratory as well for where they were able to use this particular process. I can see some faint traces of red printing on this. It looks as if it might be a number. Uh, I can't see much more under a normal light. I think what we'll try is looking at it under this laser. It produces very, very intense screen light. And we'll just have a look and see what's actually there. Ah, oh, it looks more like a name than a number. I can see the letters K, E, L, L, E, T, T. Yes, it looks like the name Kellett, I think. It's fluorescing quite brightly, certainly much better than we could see it before. Well, that's obviously an exciting new lead. You need to find somebody called Mr. Kellett now. Yes, who's written his name on that head warmer, uh, whether he were, at the time whether he had it whilst he was in the, in the army or whether he's had it since then. Absolutely essential. And there could be army connections because of the bedspread and the head warmer. Exactly. It's rather some uh, strange coincidence that we've got two rather dissimilar items in, in the boot of the car. Anybody else that you'd like to speak to? Yes, we are looking at the uh, suggestion that uh, Sandy may well have been involved in some homosexual activity. 
and it would be to that particular area of people who may involve themselves in such activities that we would seek information about Sandy McClellan himself or someone who may have been responsible for his very brutal and vicious death. A uh, 66 year old man who really didn't deserve to die as he did. Mr Baines, thank you very much indeed. And the number to ring if you can help in complete confidence, 01 811 Or if you prefer, ring Leeds Police Direct on Leeds 435353. That's 0532, the code for Leeds, 435353. And now to our Aladdin's Cave. Maybe this month we should call it Santa's Grotto. At any rate, we have a treasure house of property recovered by police and something here may be yours. If so, watch carefully. You could have it back for Christmas. Here's John Bly. Hello. Well, whatever we call it, it's certainly a fantastic and glittering array. Look at this wonderful collection of clocks. Quite astounding. And then we've got enough cannon, soldiers, guns, pistols to make an armory. I think it's quite incredible, worth a programme on their own. And look at this. A little pair of lawnettes. Now, I bet many of you will be saying, I've got some like that at home. But you haven't, you see, because these have a particularly unusual little handle of enamel, and they're silver-mounted. Now, glass and silver always combine very well, and never better and more successfully than in a claret jug. This one's quite a good example, a fairly standard pattern with a straight tapering body and a plain top. But this one, absolutely stunning. A wonderful cut glass body with quite an important repoussé and chased plated lid. Now all that part of it was silver would be worth a great deal of money but even so it's about £350. Now if we're having dessert, we've had our wine, we'd go on to have our fruit and if we were doing it properly we'd use grape scissors. You can always tell a grape scissor because it's got this little flange down here. These are silver and even those of the 1920s are quite valuable. They're about £200 today. The silver hallmarks thereon allow us to tell a great deal about silver, of course. And this little piece is modern. It's made in the Queen Anne style. The marks on that tell us that it is made of Britannia standard silver, which is a higher grade than sterling. And the owner would certainly be aware of the marks denoting this. Now, we do have one little piece of furniture, potentially, I think, the prettiest we've ever had on the programme, with a marquetry top and a cast gilt metal legs. Unfortunately, the little stretcher halfway down there has been replaced. But for the star of the programme, to me, it's got to be this collection of porcelain. Absolutely wonderful things here. Incidentally, in passing, if you have to pack up porcelain, never attach it, or the lids rather, with, with, with any adhesive tape, because when you take it off, you're going to pull the gold away, which is a great shame, so do be careful about that. But the star lot, as I say, has got to be this wonderful part dessert service. Just look at the colours. Each of those plates is individually painted, the borders are quite wonderful, and the gold work thereon is absolutely beautiful on every one. Important to us, though, is the diamond or kite mark on the back, which tells us precisely when the design was patented. In this case, the 14th of March, 1856. Now, aside from the value, which I suppose these plates are worth about £75 each, if I'd lost this, it's so beautiful, and I'd retrieved it, it would make my Christmas. I hope it makes someone's Christmas. Thank you, John. And if that's you, or if there's anything else there you think you recognise, please do call us. 01 8055. That's 01 8055. Finally tonight, we want to take you to Birmingham, to Swansea and to Chepstow. When you see the crime, you'll know why police are so anxious to solve it quickly. It's an attack on a family in their own home. They're called the Harrises, and their lives have been shattered by the experience. They were terrorised for an hour by two men armed with guns. Now they're selling up the house of their dreams and moving out. Our reconstruction begins 85 miles from Chepstow, where they live, at a market in Birmingham, where the Harrises have a regular Saturday stall. Ron Harris runs a wholesale meat business during the week called Leeway Meats, but at the weekends, he and his wife Michelle sell direct to the public at Broom Hill Market, just north of Birmingham. Each Saturday, they take a lot of ready cash. Swansea High Street in South Wales. It's Saturday the 26th of October, and while the Harrises were at their stall in Birmingham, 
a customer walked into this sports shop. It's uh, about this crossbow you sold me last week. I'd like to swap it for something a bit more, uh, more powerful. That's it you rang up earlier on. That's right. Uh, this is a crossbow. Oh, that's great. It's the most powerful one we can get. Great. I've got a bet on with a friend. I beat him in the clay pigeon shooting, and I'm going to beat him again at the crossbow shooting this weekend. Well, um, the shop could back. only lend him this crossbow for the weekend. weekend. Meanwhile, they'd order a new one he could back. keep. The man walked off up Swansea High Street, but he never brought the crossbow back. Ben, one week later, Saturday the 2nd of November. While Ron and Michelle were at the market, a relative went, as usual, to the house in Chepstow to feed the dogs. She left the house at about 4.30. As usual, the burglar alarm and some house lights were left on. Both dogs ran off wounded into the grounds and both soon died. The raiders lay in wait in the garage for the Harrises to come home. Ron and Michelle came back from the market at ten past nine with their cousin Shane. The Harrises had no cash with them. They'd arranged for the day's takings to be put into the bank. Just leave the bag down there, Shane. I'll close the door on so the dogs don't get out. Hello, Ben. The dogs aren't here. to the dogs. Oh. Hmm? It's a pity, but that's life. <laughs> now, where's the money? There's no money here. I've night saved it. You'd better not have. Now, where's, where's the money? There's none. I'll ask you once again. Where's the money? Oh. Oh. I've told you. I... Okay, get her over here. just want the money. What was that bag you carried in? A flask and a cardigan. Now keep your head down. Come on. Over the next half hour, Ron Harris was led at gunpoint through every room in the house. Under the television set. I like your wife's taste in jewellery. Is Ron going to be all right? He'll be all right, as long as he doesn't touch the panic buttons. Please, don't hurt him. Look, 
I didn't want to do this, but they've got a hold on me. Right. Get the Tom off her. Don't worry about the crap on him. Oh, Before on. they went, the robbers gagged and retied the family using tea towels from the kitchen. Look, are you making sure you're not leaving oh. anything behind you? Yes. It, it's probably the mother-in-law. It, it'll ring off in a minute. The men then made their getaway in the Harris's own Range Rover. Well, leading the investigation is Detective Chief Superintendent Mark Waters. Let's pick up where the film left off, that Range Rover. Yes, we need to hear from anyone who saw that Range Rover at 10pm on the Saturday night travelling from the Harris's home to Wycliffe, which is a, a, a lay-by about half a mile away, or if they saw any transfer from vehicles at that spot. Right, the registration number A357. W-B-O. Now, what about the jewellery that was stolen? Well, there's £15,000 worth of property stolen, but there are some uh, identifiable items of jewellery. One of these is the ram's head uh, bracelet, which is Victorian gold with sapphire eyes. Uh, it's certainly outstanding and identifiable. And the second item is a sapphire pin with pearls either side. This is about one and a half inches long, and again, it's uh, very, very identifiable. Very beautiful. It is very nice. Now they stole some guns as well, they and some ammunition. They stole two shotguns. The one, the unusual gun, is this Cogswell and Harrison. Uh, it's a pre-war gun, very valuable, not too many of them about. Right. And the other gun is the Winchester, which is quite common. That's this thing here? Yes, this is the Winchester. Now these are, are they, much more... I mean, these are quite common, but the, uh, it's one that... Uh, if someone spots, we'd want to know. It does mean that these men have got themselves something of an armory. They've got, because I know shells were stolen as well, so they've got mm. these guns, the guns that they brought, and a crossbow. And the crossbow, yeah. Right. Um, as for that crossbow, um, was it the one, uh, the, the one used to kill the dogs, the same that was taken from the shop in Swansea? Well, as you can see from our micro map, it's a good 70 miles from the Harris's home in Chepstow to Swansea, where a man collected the crossbow. Fairly sure it, it, it was the same? I'm fairly sure it's the same one. It's a very powerful one on the top of the range. Uh, a, a commando, a Barnwell commando. A uh, very powerful weapon. It's uh, capable of shooting the shaft straight through the dogs. It's extraordinary that these things uh, are legal. shouldn't be too many of those about, and uh, we're really interested if anyone has seen something like this about. Does the shopkeeper remember the man who bought it, or didn't buy it, went off with it? Yes, he describes him as a man of five foot eleven, short fair hair, um, well-spoken, well-dressed. Um, he walked away to the shopping centre with wrapped in carrier bags, so someone might have seen him. You say well-spoken. I gather that the, the two attackers were well-spoken. That was the, the single most important characteristic. Yes, well-spoken. Um, after the initial burst into the house, they were very methodical, uh, quite relaxed, no swear words. Uh, no swear up. words? No swear words at all. That, that is unusual for, for criminals in a, in a sort of high state of excitement. It is. It? It's certainly, for this, for this type of crime, it certainly is. Uh, right. Very unusual. And, uh, but they were, say, very methodical, no panic. There is a reward, I guess. There is a reward of £6,000 for information <coughs> leading to conviction of these men. Right, of two men who, as we're saying, must have something of an armoury now. If you can help catch these men, very dangerous men it seems, please ring us, 01811 8055, if you know anything at all. Or you can ring the police direct at Cumbran, the number there, Cumbran 66404. That's 06333, that's the code. 66404 is the number. And that and all our other numbers are on CFAX, and so is the address, as usual, all week. It's Crime Watch UK, BBC Television Centre, London W12, 8QT. Our next Crime Watch is on the last Thursday of next month. We will, of course, be back with the Crime Watch update immediately after question time at 11.35. Meanwhile, of course, the lines here and up and down the country remain open. They will be, as ever, open till midnight. We'll be waiting for your call. And even if first uh, Robin Day and Question Time can't keep you up till then, please do bear in mind that crime really is rarer than people think. The latest British Crime Survey finds that 40% of people expect to be burgled each year, but fewer than 1% really will be. And uh, incidentally, the chances of being physically attacked in your home by an intruder, as we've seen tonight, the chance of that is one in every three and a half thousand years. So don't have nightmares. Do sleep well.
Good night. Good night.